Okay, hey guys, sorry about the delay. Second time I'm actually doing this. If the storm within gets too loud, I take a glass too much to stun myself. Now painting is becoming a distraction for me, like rabbit hunting for the crack-brained. They do it to distract themselves. My concentration becomes more intense, my hand more sure. That is why I almost dare swear to you that my painting will improve. Because I have nothing left but that. So, can you guys tell me, could you hear the sound there? Could you hear the sound in that little clip that I played? Will you hear a, a man narrating? Could you hear that? Okay, right, so uh, I'm not quite sure what happened. I've got about 20 videos that are sort of uploaded to go, and it um, seems I must have chosen the wrong one. Uh, it's the only thing that really makes sense. So I was actually live for 10 minutes with no one in chat. I don't quite know. I must have, I guess, chosen the wrong um, template. So, so I've already done 10 minutes of Van Gogh uh as a sort of yeah um what what do you call it one man show so uh, uh this is a, a a movie that that's that came out probably in the 80s i'm going to tell you a little bit more about it in a moment but i'm going to just play a little bit more of it and um see what you guys think it's we are now at the part dealing with the owls period Last week, I did two portraits of my postman. <laughs> the good fellow, as he would not accept money, cost more eating and drinking with me. But that is a trifle evil, considering that he posed very well. The more I think it over, the more I feel that there is nothing more artistic than to love people. It's quite an interesting notion that, and, and that sort of takes us into the first letter we're going to deal with. Um, that's actually as far as I got to before I realized uh, something is, is wrong. So I'm going to go back to the beginning. Um, and that's the letter from Van Gogh to Emile Bernard. Uh, it actually talks quite frankly about his belief. So he says, my dear Bernard, uh, you do very well to be reading the Bible. I, be I begin with that because I've always refrained from advising you to do so. I don't know if you see what he's saying. He's saying, I've always um, refrained from suggesting that you read the Bible. He says, as I read the many sayings of Moses, Luke, etc., I couldn't help thinking, you know, that's all he needs. And now it has come to pass, the artistic neurosis. For that is what the study of Christ inev inevitably leads to, especially in my case, where it is aggravated by the smoking of numerable pipes. So there is a admission what he's doing excessively, and that, that's certainly not good for his health. And then some really interesting insights. He says, the Bible is Christ, for the Old Testament leads to that culmination. Paul and the evangelist stand on the other slope of the holy mountain. How small-minded the old story really is. My God, does the world consist solely of Jews who declare from the very start that all those who are different from them are impure? So that's his position. And then he says, why didn't the other nations under the great sun over there, the Egyptians, the Indians, the Ethiopians, Babylon and Nineveh, why didn't they record their annals with the same care? Well, anyway, the study of it is beautiful. And after all, being able to read everything would be tantamount to not being able to read at all. And so this is the part that I really want to emphasize. He says, but the consolation of that deeply saddening Bible, which arouses our, our despair and indignation, which seriously offends us and thoroughly confuses us with its pettiness and infectious foolishness. The consolation it contains um, like a stone inside a hard rind and bitter pulp is Christ. And that, after all, is what 
Van Gogh is actually trying to convey in his own art consolation. Um, he's trying to share the rush of life, but also the consolation that um, in the face of death that, that life is invigorating. And of course, when he paints Starry Night, he is in need of that consolation. I think Starry Night is as much a um, prayer for himself as it is for the rest of the world. Uh, yeah, so if you want to read along, I think Stephanie's already put it in there. Uh, sorry, I'm feeling a little deflated uh, to have done this for 10 minutes. Kind of for nothing is a little deflating. Anyway, um, it's quite strange what's going on in true crime. Gwyneth Paltrow's one her little case. Uh, Trump's just been indicted. Quite interesting. Um, the other thing I just wanted to highlight here is where he says, this great artist, Christ, um, and then he talks about um, parables of what a sower, what a harvest, what a fig tree. And um, that, that it's some, some of those symbolic um, constructs that he himself adopts as well. The harvest, the sower. Uh, the sower is one of his favorite themes as well. Trees blowing in the wind. Okay, let's go into the next letter. Uh, my dear Bernard, I don't know why, what I stuffed into my letter of yesterday instead of the enclosed sheet bearing on your last sonnet. And then Yeri gives an idea of how he's feeling at this point. He says, I am so worn out by work that in the evening, though writing is restful for me, I'm like a machine out of gear. So much, on the other hand, has a day spent in the full sun tired me out. So, you know, it's actually incredible that he's working this hard despite no promise of reward. He is totally fueled by, by faith. And so that then brings up this, this idea, well, faith in what? Who does he believe by in? Faith. And so, so let's have a look. Um, let's just um, see what you guys have voted so far. And so let's have a look. Uh, what is going on? Uh, can't quite see. Maybe... If I do this, no, that's not going to do it either. Uh, what is going on? Um, so what do you guys say? Who or what does Van Gogh believe in himself, humanity, God, because he, he is a Christian, or perhaps he was, or nothing? What did you guys vote? Something very weird seems to be going on. Have you guys not voted in the poll? Why am I not seeing anything? Have you guys... Let's try refreshing. I'm not quite sure what is going on. Anyway, uh, something really weird is going on, um, very unusual. Okay, I'll just carry on. <coughs> the poll doesn't work. Okay, shall, shall I cancel the poll and try it again? I'm quite sure what is going on. It really is strange. Um, Let's see if I can redo um, the poll. Uh, end poll. Start a poll. Um, I think while I'm doing this, I'm going to just play this so that I'm, it's not dead air. Um, I always think that poetry is more terrible than painting. Though painting is a dirtier and much more worrying job. And then the painter never says anything. 
He holds his tongue, and I like that, too. Just now, we are having a glorious strong heat with no wind, just what I want. There is a sun, a light that, for want of a better word, I can only call yellow. Pale sulfur yellow, pale golden lemon. How lovely yellow is. Okay, well, let's see if the poll works now. Will you let me know? I'm going to go out that screen, but let me know if it uh, if it works. Okay, well, this is really... It's so weird. I put so much effort into preparing this, and, uh, you yeah, know, it's pretty disappointing. Like, a lot more effort than usual. Does it work? Okay, that's something. Uh, so it's, we've already got 10 votes, 55, 58% say he believes in himself. I tend to agree with that. He certainly does believe in himself. 7% um, say God, 14% uh, say nothing. Uh, so at the moment, nothing and humanity are sort of neck and neck. Okay. Um, now humanity is up to 20%. Um, in a weird way, all of those are somewhat true. He, he certainly does believe in himself, but which one does he believe in more? Uh, think about he believes in himself, but doesn't he believe humanity is going to eventually come around to his art or society? If that's the better word. Does he believe in God? Well, he, he, he did. Does he believe in God now? Well, think about his relationship with his father. Uh, does he ever mention God in his letters? Do you remember his letters when he was in the Borinage? He was constantly uh, writing about Bible verses and, and that sort of thing. And now there's none of that. And then does he believe in nothing? Does he believe in nothing? So at the moment, the, 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 the least of you have voted that, 12%. Um, but about 50% say um, himself. Okay. I'll, I'll let you guys know what I voted when, when we're a little bit further into this. Okay. Let's play a little bit more from this, um, this film. I am now on the fourth picture of sunflowers. Fortunately for me, I do not hanker after victory anymore. And all that I seek in painting is a way to make life bearable. So I'm not quite sure when he said that, but it, it seems fairly fatalistic. It's almost like, you know what? I'm not going to sell my work. That's OK. By the way, um, the reason I found this is that my, my brother actually said, he found this really excellent. He found some of it very moving. And um, so that's that's really how I found it. Um, he actually gave me a DVD and I thought cheapest. There must be another way to watch this. And then I found it on YouTube. Uh, I'll share the link. <coughs> I'll share the link with you guys a little bit later. And we'll also talk a little bit about the making of this a little bit later. Okay, let's continue with the letter. So he says he's really worn out. He's standing in the sun all day. He says um, it's been a day of hard toil again today. He's working hard. And at what point is going to at what point is going to is he going to reach that point where he feels that it's kind of pointless, but that's okay, as you heard in that when he's sort of writing about the sunflowers. Thanks, uh, thanks, Stephanie. Okay, so he says, if you saw my canvases, what would you say of them? You would, you wouldn't find the almost timid, conscientious brushstroke of Cezanne in them. And so what he's saying is that he, um, it's really uh, annoying to have to say this a second time, but anyway, uh, he's saying that um, 
his brush strokes aren't small and conscientious and, and kind of timid. He's saying his um, the way that he paints, his style is becoming confident, extravagant, violent, aggressive, assertive, all of those things. If you think about it, in a way, his art is a um, alter ego to, to himself. So if you think about his art is very expressive, very um, bold, I guess is a good word, whereas beside his art, the, the figure that that uh, walks down the street, that, that's regarded as a street dog, is kind of a, a very small person just in terms of the um, perception of the Arlesians. Um, you know, he doesn't have very high status. So in terms of his status and the way people perceive him, is a very small, quiet, misunderstood person. And so that aggravation, that agitation seems to start going into his art where he, where he paints to some extent with agitation, frustration, ex excitement. Do you see what I'm saying? And um, uh, when I was at school, I was sort of in the middle of high school. And uh, I'm someone who can be quite extroverted and quite sometimes I can be quite introverted. And um, I was going through a very introverted phase in sort of the middle of high school. And I was simultaneously also writing a lot. And one day my English teacher said, I, I can see what you're doing. And I said, what, what? And she said, you are using your vehicle, your um, writing, like a ventriloquist uses a dummy. You, you're speaking through your writing or you're letting your writing speak for you. And, and I think that is what Van Gogh is kind of also doing. He's trying to speak in a way that, for whatever reason, he can't or, or isn't allowed to. You kind of get that sense. It's very colorful, very bold, very, um, very expressive, very engaging. Meanwhile, the actual Van Gogh is the sort of quiet guy who doesn't have any friends, who sort of, um, you know, um, goes on his lonely way into the middle of a field, paints all day, only has the wind for company and comes all the way back. So socially, he has no status, no significance. And so his art is trying to almost address that. Almost, um, um, what's the word? Um, kind of make up for that. You get that sense. Uh, Iceland, good to see you. Welcome. Welcome to everyone else. Bridget, Josie, Mel, Stiller, SMK, Walensky, Sharon. Nice to see everyone. Uh, let's have a quick look at the poll again. 55% um, say believes in himself. And then it's almost split three ways with humanity, God, and nothing. <clears throat> now, can I ask you a question? If, if you believe that he believes in himself, can he also be um, someone who might take his own life? In other words, if he believes in himself, is he the kind of person who would take his own life? If the thing that sets him apart, that the thing that is so idiosyncratic about him compared to, say, any other person, is that he's got this incredible, unshakable self-belief. How can that then mean that, because you, you would say that by definition, taking your own life is giving up in your belief in yourself. Do you think that that is what happened? That he woke up one day and he was like, I can't do it. I'm not going to sell any art. I am a failure. One day self-belief just kind of collapsed. Do you think that's what happened? Given that week after week, year after year, he doesn't sell his art and his self-belief isn't shaken. In fact, his art, if anything, his art just gets better. What do you guys say? <coughs> uh, 
Okay, so let's continue with this letter. So he says, as I'm now painting the same landscape, La Croix and Camargue, though it's slightly different, at a slightly different spot, there may well remain certain connections in it in the matter of color. What do I know about it? I couldn't help thinking of Cezanne from time to time at exactly those moments when I realized how clumsy his touch in certain studies is. And this part's really fascinating. He says, sorry, excuse the word clumsy. Seeing that he probably did these studies when the mistral was blowing, like me, as half the time I'm faced with the same difficulty, I get an idea of why Cezanne's touch is sometimes so sure, whereas other, at other times it appears awkward. It's his easel that's reeling. Remember I was saying Van Gogh's technique isn't just him dabbing the canvas, it's also the canvas vibrating like that against the wind. And here he's actually saying that. And he's saying some of that clumsiness of the brush stroke is due to, well, the, it's almost like writing on, um, uh, you know, sometimes when you don't have a table and then you, you write on someone's, um, back or, or or something like that. that someone bends over and you write but it's not really a stable surface so that kind of thing that that causes writing to be a bit wonky uh, art can also be if you're trying to paint on a surface that's doing that you might say you know what uh, it's okay if it's not 100 percent what i wanted to do and so is that how it created a particular effect Okay, so he goes on to say, um, oh, one more thing that I want to say is we're actually dealing with um, some of the heads of state in the art world. So when, when he talks of Cezanne, and Cezanne is now painted in the same area, um, it's literally the second most expensive art right now in the world. Um, when you talk about Paul Gauguin, it's about third or fourth most expensive art right now in, in, in art history. So when you talk about all of these artists, uh, Vincent van Gogh, um, Cezanne, Monet, um, and um, Paul Gauguin, have I mentioned all four of them? Um, that is like almost the... the, the top four most celebrated artists, give or take. Um, the most, the, the artist is reckoned to be the most priceless right now in the world. And so this is the world that Van Gogh finds himself in. He is going to rub shoulders with Gauguin. He is walking in the footsteps in a way of Cezanne, comparing himself to him. Um, same with Monet. His brother is exhibiting Monet, like, not right now, but kind of at this time in his apartment. Writers like Guy uh, du Maupassant are, you know, um, visiting to see this exhibition. And then there's also, um, sorry, I'm thinking like three different thoughts at the same time. Um, yeah, okay. I also like Cezanne, 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 okay. Anyway, let me, uh, so this is where he actually talks about working excessively fast. He says, I've sometimes worked excessively fast. Is it a fault? I can't help it. For instance, I painted a size study canvas the summer evening at a single sitting. Take it up again? Impossible. Destroy it? Why should I? You see, I went, I went out to do expressly while the mistral was raging. Isn't that incredible? He basically said, Jeepers, the wind is blowing like hell. I'm going out there and I'm going to be part of this, this storm. Right? He says, aren't we seeking intensity of thought rather than tranquility of touch? But under the given conditions of working spontaneously on the spot and given the character of it, is a calm, well-regulated touch always possible? Goodness gracious. As little, it seems to me, as during an assault in a fencing match. Uh, then he says, I've sent your drawing to my brother and urgently begged him to buy something from you. If my brother can do it, he will, for he well knows how keen I'm, I must be on your selling something. 
if you like, I will earmark for an exchange with you the head of the Zouave, that's the soldier, which I've painted. Only I won't speak of it unless I can let you sell something at the same time. And now he talks about brothels. It does seem that Van Gogh and Bernard and Gogard have, have done a lot of brothel visiting when they are in the same place because it keeps coming up. So Yeri says, uh, if we did a picture, if, if the two of us did a picture of a brothel, I feel sure that we would take my study of the Zouave for character. Ah, if only several painters agreed to collaborate on important things. The art of the future will show us examples of this, perhaps. For the pictures that are necessary now, many would have to join hands in order to cope with the material difficulties. Alas, we haven't got as far as that yet. And then he says something really interesting. He says, the art of painting doesn't move as fast as literature. If you think about that, art right now that is the talk of the town continues to be, you know, over 100 years old, whereas books, uh, when last did you read a 100-year-old book? When last did you read a 50-year-old book? Um, books tend to keep pace with modernity far more than art in, in, in a certain sense. Anyway, so he goes on to say, just like yesterday, I'm writing you now in a great hurry, greatly exhausted, and I'm also unable to draw at the moment my capacity to do so, having been utterly exhausted by morning in the fields. How tired you get in the sun here. So this is a real intimate um, portrait of how he's actually feeling, what he's doing, what he's doing and how he's feeling, right? So you can see he's got a very strong mind and his mind is driving his body to paint during these um, storms and high winds. And um, despite the heat, he's just forcing himself to paint. And all in like one go, this is where he's learning to be the Van Gogh that we ultimately get to know. The, the, the guy who paints everything in one sitting. And that's something, by the time Paul Gauguin arrives on the scene, that's how Van Gogh is painting. And he's very disturbed by it. And, and, and I think ordinary folk are as well. It's like, what are you doing? This is not how you paint a painting. Same thing with the way I've written books. So you wrote a book in two weeks. Okay, so um, that's obviously not a book. And that's, I think, the same way that they approach his art. Uh, if you painted that very quickly, it, it, it means it's not, it's not worth anything. And then how ironic what, how things turned out. Anyway, it says, um, I can't say whether the studies are good or bad. I, I have seven studies of Wheat fields, all of them landscapes, unfortunately, very much against my will. The landscapes, yellow, old gold, done quickly, 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 and in a hurry. Just like the harvester who's silent under the blazing sun, intent only on his reaping. So in a weird way, he's comparing himself as the artist that is reaping the scene, and he must do so quickly, while the light's in a particular way. He's comparing himself to the harvester harvesting the crop. The, and, and so it's no wonder that he's thinking about the Bible because it's harvest time and, and he's a very symbolic fellow. And he's always been very into themes like the sun harvesting and, and, the, and things like the sower. Then he says, I cannot help thinking that you may well be surprised to see how little I like the Bible. So I think this is now going to address one aspect in the poll. He says, although I've often tried to study it a little, there's only that colonel, Christ, who seems superior to me from an artistic point of view, at any rate different from Greek, Indian, Egyptian, Persian antiquity, though they were so far advanced. But Christ, I repeat, is more of an artist than the artist. He works in the living spirit and the living flesh. He makes men instead of statues. And that's what he's trying to imbue his art with. A living spirit, right? He's trying to imbue it with just a simple word, life. He's trying to put life into his art. 
And then I feel only too well that I'm an ox, being a painter, I who admire the bull, the eagle, man with a veneration that will prevent me from being uh, uh, ambitious. So can you see, he says, I admire that, 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 but also man. So um, who, what is he? Is he, does he believe in himself? Does he believe in God? Does he believe in society? In other words, is he a humanist? What's going on here? A handshake, your sincerely Vincent. And then he talks a little bit about morality. He says, you tell society that it is infamous because the you know what, to that word, reminds us of meat in the marketplace. That's all right. Um, blah, 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 meat in the butcher shop. I'm not sure why I'm... I'm not saying the words because this is not monetized i guess it's just instinct but uh anyway either become a mere brute i understand i feel it i rediscover a sensation in my own life so that's how he sees himself do you think he loves himself if he describes himself as a mere brute he says that is well uh, he says i'm well spoken for the sonorous rhythm of the colorful words evoke for me with great intensity, the brutal reality of the slums. But on me, the brute, the reproaches directed against society, such hollow words as le bon Dieu, the good God, no longer make any impression. So are you getting a sense of how he actually feels about God? I say that isn't the real thing, and I, I sink back into my brutish state. <coughs> I forget poetry, which is powerful enough at first to dispel my stupefaction. Is this true or not? Establishing facts as you do in the beginning is cutting with a scalpel as the surgeon does when he explains anatomy. I listen attentively and full of interest, but when the dissecting surgeon later starts moralizing at me like, like that, then I don't think his final tirade is the same value as his demonstration. Studying, analyzing society, there it is. Studying, analyzing society means more than moralizing any time. And so I, I guess that's maybe a, a, a good um, moment to say what I voted, and it was before I read this, um, that he's a humanist. He believes in society, but or he wants to. He believes in humanity, or he wants to. Uh, he's, not, he's, not, he's not a selfish person, so it's not that he, although he believes in himself, I guess he believes more in his art as a, as a balm for humanity, but that's really what's happening. And that's why so many people misunderstand Van Gogh is because on, on a fairly simple question like that, you know, what does he actually believe in or who does he actually believe in? Most people don't actually know. So the answer isn't actually himself, uh, although you could say, well, that's your opinion. And he doesn't believe in nothing, although sometimes it appears that way. And he doesn't believe really in God, although he once did. But the answer is he believes in humanity. And that's, to me, what this letter has just said. And, yeah, I, um, I, I totally, I totally, that totally resonates with me. I mean, uh, if you know me and you know my attitude to true crime, I'm trying to save humanity and that's why it agitates me to see how the rest of the true crime community take the path of least resistance let's be sensationalized let's be um let's be shocked let's be titillated let's uh be entertained and so on and it's like is this who we are becoming are, are we becoming um clowns and savages and I don't know, just, is, is that who we are? Is that as good as we are ever going to get? Are, are we ever going to transition to, I don't know, just uh, some, some, some level above the um, sort of the bottom dweller? You know, can we, um, can we be intelligent intellectuals a little bit? Can we be, can we be honest? Can we be um, real or, or do, do we always just want to hear what we want to hear?
Harold says, I also believe in humanity. Yeah, and I mean, as Josie says, um, is reality, sorry, is humanity worth, let's put it like this, did humanity deserve Van Gogh? Did, did it deserve his efforts? What do you think? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Okay, so let's continue. Um, to see where we are. So can you see, studying, analyzing society means more than moralizing any time. And um, so to me, like in the true crime space, I'm always trying to look at how did this, for the lack of a better word, evil, or how did this person, how did this maladaptive response how did that come out of the world? What created this sickness? And and not not to say you're guilty, you at fault, you told a lie, red flag, red flag, but to say this is what ails our society, this is what ails us, this is what ails you, this is what ails me. How can we learn from it? Can we recognize it first of all? If we can, can we do anything about it? And you don't get near to that thing where, when the whole thing is all about um, Brian Koberger is a narcissist or uh, Alec Murdoch is a uh, psychopath. That, that kind of It's a kind of moralizing thing where you say, you evil and I'm good. Well, you're not going to save society that way. You need to figure out how those dynamics actually work in that instance and then apply it back to yourself, right? And that's also why when we deal with Van Gogh, we're not just dealing with it because it's fun. At the end of the day, we want to look at why did society in, in, the, in that time, despite 900 letters, why did society not understand who this guy was, that, that, that they wouldn't buy his art? What mistake did he make? What mistake did they make? Um, and then... And then, and then the, the persistence of, what can one call it, ignorance? The fact that, can, is it okay that 130 years later we can still be mistaken about Van Gogh? That's pretty devastating. If you say in 130 years of art history, we still don't have any idea who somebody was, cheapest. Uh, that's, so, so, so now it's not just, in the true crime space, you see what you want to see. Is that also true in the art space? You see who you want to see. You, In terms of the art, you see what you think you're just projecting onto it. And so is that true with literally everything? Everything you see and hear what you want to see and hear. That is, and, and, and so in this era right now of social media, is it just echo chambers? We're all just living in echo chambers. So you can't tell the truth. You must just try and resonate with someone's echo in their own echo chamber. So that's kind of what you're trying to do. So we're trying to say, let's get real um, to break through this problem that's going on with so many people. You know, that's what, what you're trying to, yeah, I'm the same. That's also well said. Okay, so let's continue. What a deep letter from Van Gogh. He says, nothing would seem queerer to me than saying, for instance, here is that meat from the marketplace. And you know what he's referring to. Now observe how in spite of everything, it may be electrified for a moment by the stimulus of a more refined and unexpected love. He's kind of saying here, what if you have a woman of the street, to use that term, and someone happens to fall in love with her and, and she, she then becomes a person? In a way, it's, he seems to be um, conjuring a female version, perhaps, of himself and saying, when someone is loved, they become worth something, um, but they're worth something in their own right, um, and they are capable of loving and being loved, kind of thing. Anyway, then he says, just like the sated caterpillar that doesn't eat anymore, 
had crawled on a wall instead of crawling on a cabbage leaf. So this sated female can no longer love, even if she does her best. She's seeking, seeking, seeking. Does she herself know that? She's conscious, alive, sensitive, galvanized, rejuvenated for a moment, but impotent. Isn't he kind of talking about himself there? He's conscious, alive, sensitive, galvanized, rejuvenated for a moment, but impotent. Yet she can still love, so can he. So she's alive, so is he. Yet no prevaric uh, prevarication is possible. Uh, although she may be, I think prevarication is uh, to do with telling the truth, isn't it? Um, the deliberate act of deviating from the truth, yeah. Um, although she may be finished and dying the death of a terrestrial beast, where will this butterfly emerge from the chrysalis? This butterfly that was the sated caterpillar. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to read that. Um, well, this is where I have to go. This is where I have got to in my study of that. I too would like to know approximately what I am, the lava of myself, perhaps. So it's quite interesting. He's reflecting on himself as a worm, as a lava, and, and, and is he going to become the butterfly or not? By the way, yesterday was Van Gogh's birthday. Uh, sorry, it's not, uh, yeah, um, the 30th was Van Gogh's birthday, uh, which I think is your today, right now, it's yesterday for me. The 30th of March was Van Gogh's birthday. Uh, by the way, sorry that I didn't do a Van Gogh's letters yesterday. I took some people out to dinner and we ordered a really awesome bottle of red wine. It was delicious. It's one of, and it's not a wine that I'd had before. And we were just all in a good mood and we chatted for hours and hours. Um, got home really, really late. Um, and I just sort of felt like I want to do some work. Uh, not that this isn't work, but um, yeah. And so um, by the time I'd done that, there wasn't really much time left. So, so apologies for that. Um, yeah. Okay. So it, it's in March that he turned 35. And so you, you, you know that by March 1889, he'll be 36. And he dies at about 37 and a half. So he's, he's in, into the end game at this point. Okay, so that is a really good letter. I think you'll agree that that letter was worth not skipping over. Um, okay, so I'm going to play a little bit more from this, this thing. Oh, my dear brother, sometimes I know so well what I want. I still have a kind of concentrated power which only has to spend itself in work. I must be allowed to stress my own personality in a portrait, not only myself, but an impressionist in general, a simple worshipper of the external Buddha. I have made the eyes slightly slanting like the Japanese. I have just bought a dressing table with everything necessary and my little room is complete. You cannot imagine what peace of mind it gives me. I shall end up not feeling lonesome in this house. Hope is breaking for me vaguely on the horizon. So uh, this is obviously narrating the period where he's in the yellow house and he's saying how it's really good for his confidence. He's got, a, he's got his own place and he can decorate it his own way and a friend of his is on his way there and things are looking um really um positive um like kind of sparkling and um how does how do you go from that 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 place of um richness and assertiveness and and kind of growing potency to teetering insecurity how do you go from there to there how does that change what changes uh, the voice is John Hurt. John Hurt. Uh, 
It is quite a famous voice. Okay, let's continue. 28th of June, my dear Theo, I suppose it was to convince me that being myself one of the most absent-minded of mortals, I have no right whatever to reproach these southerners with their carelessness. That That is the line I used to title for, for the title of this video. By the way, if we come across a line that's better, you're welcome to just let me know and say, no, it's um, uh, John Hurt. So if you, if you come across, there's a line that I read that you think is a better title, just let me know. I, hopefully I'll uh, take note. So here is the sower. Look at that electrified sun. That is trying to show not just, uh, look, there's a guy walking on the ground uh, from left to right. This, um, this landscape is throbbing with life. This is an opportunity, this is, this is a day where the, 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 that spark of creation is continuing to, almost like a shockwave, um, you know, is, is continuing to sort of spread around the universe, including where we are, right? Okay. I was an idiot enough once more to address my letter to 54 Rue Laval instead of Le Pic. So the post office clerks who sent back the letter and uh, opened have had the pleasure of edifying themselves by the contemplation of Bernard's brothel. <laughs> I hasten to send on the letter as it is. The morning, this morning, I received part of the order for pains from Tangi. Um, his cobalt is too bad. Um, us to order any more of it from him okay so the, the blue is quality is really bad as his chromes are rather good we can go on ordering those but instead of carmine he sends some um dark matter i'm not sure what that is which isn't too important uh, but not to have any more carmine at all would mean a very serious shortage in his poor old show it's not his fault but in the future i will put tangy beside the names of the paints that one can buy from him. Yesterday and today I worked on the sower. So he's doing this now at this point. And can you see how he's starting to obsess over yellow? He's starting, the sun is getting bigger and bigger. Um, it's becoming, he's becoming himself, right? He's, he's in that place. He says, um, the sky is yellow and green, the ground violet and orange. There's certainly a picture of this kind to be painted of this splendid subject. Uh, and I hope it will be done someday, either by me or someone else. He's trying to paint a very big, um, kind of momentous, um, pulsating um, billboard to to this idea and um, is hoping that that he's going to be the person to do it someday and um, well was he then he says this is the point the Christ in the boat by that's this picture by Eugene Delacroix there's Christ so in what he's kind of saying is I'm trying to paint my version of that based on where I am and so he says, um, the sower, that and the sower are absolutely different in execution. The Christ in the boat, I'm speaking of the sketch in blue and green with touches of violet. He knows that 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 painting, like almost with a photographic memory, right? He doesn't have it in front of him like we do. So he says, um, it speaks a symbolic language through color alone, right? That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to do his version of Christ in a boat, but through color. And so when he paints this, the sower, he's trying to paint um, that idea, that very uh, idea of consolation and something with, with tremendous religious um, feeling, not necessarily of Christ, but 
but but that there's something holy and um and 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 stunning and evocative and beautiful and divine about the landscape one finds oneself in you know it's summer you feel the warmth on your skin you know you don't have to walk around on a planet in a spacesuit you can literally uh, breathe in the in the nourishing oxygen you can be have your skin nourished by the the rays of golden sun just just the same way that leaves um are nourished by you know the radiation going into them and that's what he's trying to get at is that there's something indescribably beautiful and wonderful just about being alive right and and it's it's something that's so incredible it's kind of got biblical proportions even though he doesn't really believe in god he's saying well even though i don't believe in god this is like this is this is really momentous but how do i how do i say it and so he tries to do that i don't think he does really that well but he tries to do that with the sun that is kind of exploding right that's what he's trying to say Yvonne are you leaving us okay well thanks for being here catch you on the replay okay bye Yvonne the rest of the class let's continue guys let's concentrate <laughs> okay so do you follow what I'm saying so he says um he's trying to paint he's trying to paint a symbolic language through color alone he's trying to do the same thing that's not very easy to do um definitely not easy to do by the way there was another artist in south africa who came from belgium franz clarot uh similar to van gogh he first um he was a priest first or he was in the priesthood first although Clara had continued to be unlike Van Gogh, uh, but he was also fascinated with sunflowers and the sun. Of course, the sun in South Africa is a lot like the sun in the south of France if you're coming from Europe. And um, I think I, I wrote an article about Clara titled "Searcher of the What is it? Searcher of the something like Searcher of the Free State Sun or something like that." Um, but yeah, and, and so the sun being a uh, allegory for God, for life, for resurrection, for rebirth, all those things. So in a way, Franz Clarot, and I can maybe uh, show you some pictures that he did, um, is a, another iteration in a way of Van Gogh. Um, my father actually has some of his paintings. He actually met him. Um, yeah so this is actually and so he would paint for example a a black woman with her child and then and then that would like kind of be madonna and child you know it was just an african version almost of that that thing um but you you may recognize a sort of Van Goghiness, uh, a, a sort of quaint uh, sort of Van Goghiness in some of his art. Um, so he has uh, the Robertson Art Gallery, that's, that is him. Can you see that donkey pulling a cart? Can you see that, that image? Let's uh, see if I can blow it up. Can you see that? Can you see it's got a it's got some of those almost neon like colors that Van Gogh has. It's also got a clumsy way almost of of painting things, almost a, like a cartoon. Um, let's see if I can show you uh, some more. As I said, I've written a, an article about him. Um, so there's a, another version. See if I can find my article. I wonder if it's still available online. Searcher of the. Oh, it's it's actually Catcher of the Free State Sun. Yeah, that's actually what it is. So this is the article I wrote. Um, there it is. So these are some of the 
artworks that I chose to to um, tell that story. So that's there. He is literally showing someone catching the sun. All right, in that in that picture, the 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 the, the human forms in in his art are, are clearly much bigger than those in Van Gogh's art, but some of the colors are similar. Um, I took this photo uh, just to rep, try and represent a local scene of kind of a mother and child. Um, so that, that was what that was about. Um, this is a painting that actually belongs to my father that, that he painted. And um, he, he really liked donkeys. Um, if Van Gogh liked sunflowers, he liked uh, donkeys. As you can see there's a bit of a cartoonish at, uh, aspect to the way that he paints things in the same way that Van Gogh also did. It's just a different way of looking at it. So this is what he said. Why paint landscapes when you can empty a paintbrush with women, donkeys, and sunflowers? That's what that's one of the things he said. So those are just some of his his uh, paintings. Anyway, so if you're interested in reading this article on your own time, then you're welcome. Um, is there anything else I can show you? Um, yeah, yes, just another, just some some another version of his art. You can see this is a very similar, it's a very similar palette uh, to Van Gogh: greens, yellows. You see over there. The, the the main difference is that he 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 prefers the um, and I, and I think the reason is because Van Gogh was a lonely person and a loner, whereas Father Clarot was he was a he was a they called him the painting priest. I mean he had lots of friends. He is friends with the congregants. Um, he would also paint. Um, uh, African women kind of nude or semi-nude and people wondered what's going on there and there was some chatter about that but can you see how he definitely prefers to have animals and people in the foreground and the landscape sort of as the background whereas Van Gogh kind of has it the opposite he has the landscape being the star of the show and then people and animals are sort of secondary or or um you know what i'm saying so it's just a it's, a, it's a, the same use of color uh and symbolism but a different um focus for that yeah okay right let's go back to this so he says malay so is a colorless gray like israel's pictures now so so what is so important about exactly what he's saying here i knew this intuitively i didn't need to go and find it in the letter i could tell that he was using color symbolically but what is so important is when he loses his ear and in the run-up to him losing his life what is he trying to communicate with color then because he is he's, he's saying things through the use of color and so then, then the answer is what's he trying to say to us and um, when you read my book, you'll see how carefully and concisely I've interrogated that question. Okay, so let's continue. It says, now you could paint the sower in color with a simultaneous contrast of, for instance, yellow and violet. I don't know if he really succeeds with the sower. I, I think he's thought about what he wants to do. I don't know if he really succeeds. It, to me, there's far too much violet. Um, and it needs maybe another color as well. Anyway, he says, uh, like the Apollo ceiling of Delacroix, which is just that, yellow and violet. Let's just have a look at that Delacroix. Is that where he got the idea? Kind of get the idea that he, he got the idea from the sky. So there, there's some yellow here. Do you see that? 
there's some yellow there and then there's the violet if that's the right color and so van gogh then does does that this way instead of the sky here that's violet he has it on the ground and there's even some birds flying around i don't think this is very well executed at all um the sun well done but but this figure is terrible and it's like sorry uh, uh maybe you were trying to do something but whatever you wanted to do you didn't succeed i wouldn't want to hang that in my house just being honest uh anyway it says and it makes you as absent-minded as a sleepwalker and yet if only one could do something good so it seems like he he uh, acknowledges that he's is not succeeding that, that he's trying to do something but he's not being able to do it uh, what does he say? A, a mess that is damnably difficult to get out of with honor. Well, let's be of good heart and not despair. I hope to send you this attempt along with some others soon. I have a view of the Rhone, the Iron Bridge at Trinquetail. That's this one. That's even a lot better. Also, a lot of, it seems like at this point he's experimenting with yellow and purple. Do you see that? Uh, it says the sky and the river, the color of absinthe. Whoa, that's already telling you where his mind is, right? The sky and the river, the, the color of absinthe. So that's that's what's going on. So remember I was saying, how on earth do you go from being kind of, in an artistic sense, the king of your kingdom, and then you end up, this teetering um you know this teetering vessel of insecurity well he has one way to do that um to not be able to deal with your loneliness and every day every night gets worse and then you find that you drink more and more and 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 that's now going to not be good for your health it's not going to be good for what your neighbors think of you and it's not going to be good for your ultimately your mental health e either because when you wake up in the morning the only difference is you're not less lonely you 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 more lonely with a hangover you've got less money now as well right gloria says I would gladly hang the sew in my home. I'm sorry. I, I love it. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so he says, um, talks about the keys, a shade of lilac, the figures leaning on their elbows on the parapet, blackish, the iron bridge, an intense blue with a note of vivid orange in the blue background and a note of intense malachite green. Another very crude effort, and yet I'm trying to get at something utterly heartbroken and therefore heartbreaking that's what he's trying to communicate i'm trying to get at something utterly heartbroken and therefore utterly heartbreaking do you think he succeeds and you know like if, if you think about it what is actually going on here isn't it what he's trying to say is there are figures in this in this picture and they are What's the word? They are separate from one another. They disconnected from one another. It's like every man for himself. Anyway, I don't. I don't know if that's what he's trying to do. But uh, does he succeed in? Does this? Is this a heartbreaking picture? Nothing from Gorgon. I certainly hope to get your letter tomorrow. Forgive my carelessness. A handshake, ever yours, Vincent. So can you tell that he's, he's starting to drink at this point? It's starting to come into his letters. So we're going to go into the 29th. But before we do, let's play some more of this. That hope in intermittent flashes like a lighthouse, which has sometimes comforted me during my solitary life. 
I was wild to see my pictures in frames, and I had ordered too many for my budget. But I venture to think that if you saw the studies, you would say I was right to work at white heat as long as it was fine. I had a new idea in my head. This time, it's simply my bedroom. Only here, color is doing everything, and gives, by its simplification, a grander style to things. It's suggestive here of rest or of sleep. Looking at the picture ought to rest the brain, or rather the imagination. The walls are pale violet. The floor is of red tiles. The sheets and pillow, very light greenish lemon. The coverlet scarlet. The window green. The toilet table orange. The basin blue. The door lilac. And that is all. The broad lines of the furniture again must express inviolable rest. The frame, as there is no white in the picture, will be white. This, by way of revenge for the enforced rest, I was obliged to take. So yeah, we, I don't know if we're quite there yet. I, he, I don't think he's painted the sunflowers, but we sort of on our way. We're trying to make our way to that point. So the summer is sort of uh, moving. It's it's um, what's the word? The, the summer is progressing. So now we are. Is there another letter in June? Now we are the, you're going to deal with the last letter in June. Aren't you glad that we didn't rush through the rest of the June letters? Um, well, more than we have. My dear Theo, many thanks for your letter for the 50 franc note and the package of Tassé's paints and canvases, which has just arrived. He has put in his bill, which comes to 50 francs, so that I'll be able to check his prices and compare with them to Eduard's. So, so can you see what's happening He's not only getting money from Theo, he's also getting paints and canvases and whatnot sent to him. So whatever money Theo sends, if it's 50 francs or 100 francs, he's actually paying more than that in, in, in order to keep Vincent painting. Um, that's worth bearing in mind. It's not just 50 francs here and there. It's 50 francs plus ongoing art supplies with, with nothing to show for it. Anyway, so he says, um, your letter brings great news, namely that Gorgon agrees to our plan. So yeah, you have the, so if, if you think that, that the loneliness is getting to him and he's starting to drink and then, and then he gets this good news, it's like, Thank goodness. Uh, wow, I really need him to come here. It's going to be amazing. Well, now it's 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 not even July. So what's going to happen now is, okay, well, Gauguin's coming. Well, when is he coming? And then it's like, well, maybe next week or the week after. The entire July is going to go by, no Gauguin. And that's going to make his loneliness 10 times worse. The entire August is going to go by, no Gorgon, and that's going to make it even worse. And then I think it's most of September. So the fact that he says I'm coming and then it takes three months, it's a little bit like a little boy waiting out on the front lawn for his friend to arrive and his friend's supposed to arrive at, let's say, 10 o'clock in the morning. And by two o'clock, he's still not there. And the, the mother sort of shouts from the front door, uh, don't you want to come in and have lunch? Um, you know, if he, if he arrives, he will, he'll, he'll come in anyway. It's not that he's going to drive by. He doesn't know where it is. Don't you want to come in and have lunch? No, no, no. I've waited here for four hours. I think I'm going to carry on waiting. And then, and then what happens? And, and also, what happens when, when he eventually does arrive? How do you feel when you've spent five hours waiting for someone and then they eventually arrive or whatever the time is? You, you're kind of depleted. You're kind of vulnerable. You're also kind of kind of in a bad mood. Are you supposed to, do you only have nice things to say to someone who's made you wait that long? Um, you, you can't wait to see them, but you also, somewhere in your mind, the thought is brewing. That's, that's not very nice what you're doing, um, you know? Terry, we are sorry that you can't stay. Yeah, I think 
Gauguin gets there at the very end of September, if I, if I remember correctly. He's there basically for just two months, and then that's it. That's the other part that's disappointing. Can you imagine in our little analogy here, you wait five hours for your friend to arrive as a child. Then they arrive, and then now they, wanna, they need to leave two hours early or whatever. So in the end, they're only there for half an hour, an hour, when you w waited for them for, for that for twice that length of time. Can you see how that can be really painful? And that's what uh, I think a lot of people don't understand. Like, um, if you uh, said, yeah, you know, my friend was supposed to come, but he came late. Anyone would say, yeah, well, you know, sometimes that happens. But if you don't have any friends, if you not only you don't have any friends, but you're very lonely, then that's going to weigh on you terribly. Um, and it's not only the loneliness of I'm a Dutch person in France by myself, it's also the loneliness of I'm a Dutch person that nobody understands. Every day I go out and paint paintings and nobody buys them. It's that, that sort of soul, um, it's something that should be soul destroying that Van Gogh nevertheless, um, has some kind of resilience to, but but he's obviously not invulnerable. You know, he is being worn down. And so so basically from this point onwards, Gorgon's coming, right? So from this point onwards, this is the beginning of the downward spiral, which is going to end up him being in the asylum. Right? It's to do with expectation. And anticipation but not for an ordinary person for someone who is very lonely to begin with and then he copes with his loneliness through drinking and then of course when the person eventually arrives is a is a rotten influence and makes things 10 times worse by abandoning his friend as well okay so let's continue thanks uh, iceland aloha okay uh he says, certainly the best thing would be for him to come rushing here at once. Can you see how he's thinking about it? You know what? Uh, uh, Gogol could be here by Friday. Gogol might be, uh, you know, he, sh he might even be here the day after tomorrow. He could actually be here any minute now. I need to get this place ready. Um, he, he could be coming through the door at any moment. I need to, we need, I need to get cracking, right? Um, I need to change everything here so, so that Gorgon's going to approve. Um, right? That's kind of how he's thinking about it. I, I need to prepare this place because Gorgon's going to be at any minute. I think I'm going to sweep the floor right now. I think I'm actually going to clean the windows. Gorgon could be here by the end of the week. What's he going to think of um, the wash basin or the toilet, whatever? Let me sort all of that out. You see what's happening. Instead of getting out of a mess, he will probably get into one if he goes to Paris first. Perhaps he might make a deal with the pictures he will be bringing along with him, which would be great luck. Here with a reply. I only want to say this, that I'm uh, not only am I enthusiastic about painting in the South, but equally so about the North, because I am in better health than six months ago. So, as I say, right here where he is now, he's in a great place. He's healthy, he's productive, he's painting some of the best paintings yet. He's um, got his own place, right? He's, he's poised for greatness right here and now. And so what threatens that? What, what's going to threaten that? What's going to pull the carpet out from under him? Not so much what, who. He says, so that if a wise... So that if it is wiser to go to Brittany, where you could get board and lodging so cheaply, from the point of view of expense, I'm certainly ready to come back to the north. So you can see he's so desperate to not be alone. He's even saying, is Gorgon coming here? That's great. Uh, but, but if he's not, I'll go to him. He's willing to give up literally everything to not be by himself. Then he says, but it would be good for him to come to the Midi. You know, you know, I don't mind going to him, but he should really come here, especially as it will already be winter in the north uh, in four months. 
And it seems so certain to me that two people doing precisely the same work ought, if circumstances prevent them spending more, to be able to live at home on bread, wine, and anything in short that you'd want to add. The, the difficulty is eating at home alone. It's not just because it's expensive. That's uh, well said, Stephanie. Certainly the Picards and Leonardo da Vinci too are not less beautiful because there are few. And on the other hand, the Monticellis, the Dormiers, the Corots, the Dubignis and the Malays are not ugly because in so many cases they've been painted with very great rapidity. So he's also starting to defend his style and um, not everyone's going to accept that explanation. Gorgon isn't, is going to say, Cheapest, can you please just freaking slow down? You don't know what you're doing. Can you please slow down? And I mean, you're like a madman. Can you just slow down, just paint and think about what you're doing? I mean, you don't have a deadline. It's not like um, you've been given an order. You've gotten an order that, that, that someone wants to buy 10 paintings of yours. What's the rush? Think about what you're doing. Um, and let's, you know, and, and no, 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 I'm going to do it this way. He says, as for landscapes, I begin to find that some done more rapidly than ever are the best of what I do. So this is where he's starting to get into that space. And um, who knows if Gorgon had come to all like the next day, maybe that whole style would have... Um, not had a chance to manifest. Anyway, for all Gauguin's um, influence, uh, he, he didn't change that aspect about Van Gogh. He was saying, Cheapest, dude, this is not, nobody paints this way. And Van Gogh was like, well, I do, uh, take it or leave it. And uh, it's really interesting when, when they did the portraits of one another, that gives you an idea of, of to some extent, the opinion of one another from those portraits. Anyway, he goes on to say, as for landscapes, I begin to find that's, that, okay, um, it's the best that, that I do. For instance, the one I sent you of uh, the cartoon of the harvest. Can you see how he, he himself uh, thinks of it as a cartoon of the harvest? He, he's not, it's not that he's unaware that he's, taking reality and is turning it into a caricature but not just some it's not just reductionist it is also breathing life into it so there's a certain amount of and and clara does the same thing there's a certain amount that is simplifying it but then there's also something else breathing life into it breathing color into it interpreting it through a kind of a divine um uh appreciation of, of what one's seeing. He says, it is true that I have to retouch the hole to adjust the brushwork a bit and to make the touch harmonious, but all the essential work was done in a single long sitting. And I change them as little as possible when I'm retouching. Uh, but when I come home after spell like that, I show you my head is so tired that if that kind of work keeps recurring as it is as it has done since the harvest began, I become hopelessly absent-minded and incapable of heaps of ordinary things. So that's the other thing that's taking place is he's starting to become a frenzied artist. He's painting in a frenzy. His mind is, is starting to uh, gather momentum. And so in a way, he's, he's starting to become taken over by the art, art monster. Um, he's, he's becoming absent-minded. And that's probably also why he's going to drink is because he feels tired. His, his body is kind of broken and he wants a drink just to deal with the, the pain and the discomfort. So in a way, you, you get the sense that from this point onwards, he may actually be overworking himself. And then 
and then maybe also overthinking when when uh, Gauguin doesn't join him. It is at times like these that the prospect of being alone is not disagreeable. Oh, okay. Not, I don't mind being alone. Okay. And very often, indeed, I think of that excellent painter Monticelli, who, who they said was such a drinker and off his head. When I come back myself on the mental labor of balancing the six essential colors, red, blue, yellow, orange, lilac, green, sheer work and calculation with one's mind strained to the utmost, like an actor on the stage in a difficult part with a hundred things to think of at once in a single hour. So he's really pushing himself hard, right? After that, the only thing to bring ease and distraction, there it is, is to stun oneself with a lot of drinking or heavy drinking. So there's your answer. It is actually loneliness. I don't think he would need to drink that much if he wasn't alone, but he's so... His mind is so busy that he needs to literally stun himself. I know what that feels like. I know when you write um, at an incredible pace, that engine won't stop running and you've got to find some way to turn the lights off and uh, drinking a couple of glasses of wine, um, one after the other. I remember I went from drinking a full glass of red wine that would work like a bomb to drinking half a bottle, like in one go, like straight from the bottle to drinking about three quarters of a bottle just to create a blank space so that you could sleep. And then eventually I was even drinking um, whiskey um, just to create that sort of thing. And I never became an alcoholic and I, and I was never like, um, I have to have a drink, but I was certainly drinking to stun myself uh, after uh, also a period of of heavy uh, mental activity um of course absent is 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 uh, like almost twice as potent as whiskey um arguably um yeah anyway so he says not very virtuous no doubt but it's to return to the subject of monticelli I'd like to see a drunkard in front of a canvas or on the boards. It is too gross a lie. All the Roque's women's uh, malicious Jesuitical slanders about Monticelli. So anyway, can you see how um, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to say you can see absinthe and drinking and there's the word drunkard. You can see that starting to enter his writing um, he talks about what he thinks about he talks he paints what he thinks about as well and so now it's starting to infect his writing the fact that he's drinking and he says uh, a lot of drinking or heavy drinking that's exactly what he's doing I think that is maybe a better title than the current one. Do you guys agree? The other one is just a little bit too mild and and sort of nice. The only thing to bring ease and distraction. Is to stun oneself with a lot of heavy drink. So it says heavy smoking, a lot of drinking or heavy smoking. Sorry, I missed that. But I mean, I think he means heavy drinking, right? And he, I think he means to kind of get drunk. Let's just see what you guys say in the comments. Stephanie says, I like a glass of wine a couple of times a week. Mel says, I don't drink. Austin says, Austin says, I never made my husband smell. Okay, um, Bridget says, I do miss being able to have a glass of red. I had a few last night, they were pretty good. Mel says, aloneness is by choice, loneliness is by fate. Um, I don't know if Van Gogh would agree with that. Uh, he might say, he might be a very good at being alone, but, you know, um, it, it is, it, it's quite tough 
not being lonely in a foreign country um, sometimes can be quite tough especially when they speak a different language Gloria says I drink a shot of brandy a day not a bottle of brandy Gloria just just a shot okay Josie says, my problem is that I drink hot cocoa every night before bed like a two-year-old. Okay. Could, it could be worse. Could be worse. Okay. So let's continue. Monticelli, the logical colorist, able to pursue the most complicated calculations, subdivided according to the scales of tones that he was balancing, certainly overstrained his brain and his work, just like Delacroix did and Richard Wagner. And if perhaps he is always it, yeah. And if perhaps he did drink, it was because he, the Yonkin too, having a strong constitution, stronger constitution than Delacroix and more physical ailments. Well, if they haven't drunk, so he's talking quite a lot here about drinking. I, I for one, am inclined to believe their nerves would have rebelled. He says, we used to smoke very strong tobacco to stupefy ourselves, okay, in the furnace of creation. Uh, don't think that I would maintain a feverish condition artificially, but understand that I'm in the midst of complicated calculation long beforehand. So now when anyone says that such and such is done too quickly, you can reply uh, that they have looked at it too quickly. So he's already kind of arming himself with a response to criticism. You're saying I'm painting too quickly? You're looking at it too quickly. Apart from that, I'm now busy going over all my canvases a bit before sending them to you. But it's almost like that. that is the same as a writer editing. Uh, when I wrote, I would write extremely quickly and then I'd come back and edit. That's the same thing that he's doing. Um, paints quickly and then comes back and just does some fine tuning, which is uh, approximate to editing. I'm actually feeling like I'm not going to be able to go on for too much longer before I'm going to need to go and sleep. So, Iceland says, I love mineral water. Okay. And cake or is that coffee? Tea. I'm now busy going over all my canvases a bit before sending them to you. But during the harvest, my work was not any easier than what the peasants we're actually harvesting we're doing so he's saying um working painting the harvest was about as hard as actually harvesting being like a farm worker that gives you an idea of what he's going through right far from complaining of it it is just at these times in artistic life even though it is not the real one that i feel almost as happy as I could be in the ideal in that real life. So can you see he really is in a good place right now? And he's about to spoil it by drinking because that's going to get worse. He's not going to be able to stop drinking more and more and more. And then also Gorgon's going to make it even worse than that is. If all goes well and Gorgon, Gorgon sees, to, sees fit to join us, we could put the thing on a firmer footing by, by suggesting he put all his pictures together with mine and share profit and loss. But either that will not happen or it will happen of itself, according to whether he thinks my painting good or bad, and also according to whether or not we cooperate. So he's quite realistic here that they may not get along. It's quite realistic about that, certainly at this point. Now I must write to Russell and I'm going to urge him to make an exchange with me. I must work hard to try to sell something on my part to help with the expenses. Well, sorry, you're not you're not going to do that. So can you imagine he knows his art's improving. He knows he's feeling happy. He's, 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 he's getting that sense of artistic flow and yet still nobody buys his art. Still, no matter what he executes, sorry, your work's a joke. Sorry, pff, what's that supposed to be? 
We must be of good heart in spite of the difficulties and working as we are to safeguard the artist's life. It will fire our blood. A hand, so can you see, it, it just does not have a problem with a lack of self-belief. If anything, his problem is his faith in humanity, including Gauguin and the people of all and so on. A handshake, I'll write again soon. I'm going into the Camargue for two or three days to make some drawings there. I'm glad that you are sending for our sister, ever yours, Vincent. I'll write Maria one of these days. <laughs> you will read the letter. You will see how I will talk to him. I can see the picture from here, the head like De La Roche. Have patience with him a little longer. Perhaps he's going through a crisis. Well, you are about to as well. So we are now at last into July, and I'm um, I'm kind of I'm quite quite tired at this point. So this I might do one letter after this one. I would have loved to have gotten through July, but I'm starting to feel tired. It's uh, this three o'clock in the morning. Okay, so the, what do you think of this painting? Rocks with oak tree. These, uh, the, this is the precursor to the cypresses that he would paint in Saint Rami, and though that's really good art as well. Like I really, of all of Van Gogh's art, I really like the cypresses, the cypress series. This is starting to go in that direction. Not quite there yet. And then this is sunny lawn in a public park, which I've. I wonder if that's in all. I don't see any buildings around there. I don't know. Not terribly, terribly good. So he says, work engrosses me so much that I cannot manage to write letters. I should have liked to write Gauguin again, but I'm afraid that he is worse than he said. His last letter in pencil looked very much as though he were. If it's true, what's to be done? I've no reply from Russell yet. Yesterday at sunset, I was on a stony heath where some very small and twisted oaks grow. In the background, a ruin on the hill and wheat in the valley. It was romantic. You can't escape it like Monticelli. The sun was pouring bright yellow rays on the bushes and the ground, a perfect shower of gold. So Yeri is, every day he um, takes his paint box and his um, easel, and, and you know, it probably is quite heavy to carry, he puts on his... Uh, straw hat, you know, as a kind of defense against the sun, and he heads out, and um, and then he has these experiences. He's standing there by himself, and he watches the sun go down, and he watches the wind blowing over the wheat, and it's one lonely day after another, but it, but it is quite scenic. He, he sees these, he's an artist looking out for beautiful scenes, and he finds them. He finds bright yellow rays on the bushes and a perfect shower of gold. All the lines were lovely and the whole thing nobly beautiful. You would not have been a bit surprised to see knights and ladies suddenly appear, coming back from hunting or hawking, or to have heard the voice of some provincial troubadour. The fields looked violet, the distance is blue. I brought back a study, but it is very far below what I tried to do. So he's kind of in a way, out of touch with reality. He knows what he wants to do. He's, he's um, got very high ambitions and, and visions, but he can't even almost, I mean, look at that. Compared to what he's just said, that is, I know it's not the same thing that he's talking about, but that is fairly bland, fairly average. If you saw that and you didn't notice Van Gogh, would you pay much attention to it? Equally, in a way, that if you saw that you didn't notice Van Gogh, would you really bother to look at it for any length of time? Then he says, um, I was planning to go to the Camargue, but the veterinary surgeon who, who was to have taken me with him has left me in the lurch. <laughs> so, yeah, well, I shouldn't laugh. Um, I guess maybe left him on purpose. I don't much care as I have only a moderate affection for wild bulls, okay? To my amazement, I can 
already see the bottom of my purse, though it is true that I have had to pay my month's rent. You must realize that when I take the money for food and lodging out of it, all the rest goes into canvases, really. Not into absinthe, not into brothel uh, expenses. Altogether, these are pretty expensive, not counting the trouble they give. I dare hope that someday we'll get back part of the money we spend. And if I had more, more money, I should spend even more to try to get a very rich coloring. It's quite a weird turn of phrase. He's like a poor artist, but his colors are rich. Yeah, here's a new subject, a corner of a garden with clipped shrubs and a weeping tree and in the background some clumps of oleanders. You know oleanders, it's a poisonous bush, but, but quite pretty, often has pink flowers. I think that's, that might be an oleander there, or maybe, no, more, more likely there. I think that's an oleander. Do you guys agree? Okay. I'm in the middle of reading Balzac, Cesar Bira 2. Let's see if we can find out what that's about. Catch up. Okay, so according to Goodreads, um, someone, this, this dude lived most of his life one step from his creditors. Does that sound familiar? Well, just that he was struggling financially. His house in Paris even had a special exit for avoiding them. No one knew more about money problems than Balzac. And this is his subject in Rise and Fall of Caesar Burra II, one of Balzac's greatest novels. It's the story of this guy, an honest perfumer, who's lured into overextending himself. That's, that's really extraordinary because that is exactly what's about to happen to Van Gogh. So, I mean, if he needs a cautionary tale, here it is. Some dude who's lured into overextending himself, Van Gogh was about to do the same thing. This luring is the work of the unsavory du Tillet, an employee fired for embezzlement. Well, Van Gogh's going to also uh, encounter, excuse me, kind of like a rogue, someone who's not really going to steal from him, but just have a horrible influence on his life. He's going to come out of the experience minus one ear, not, not a terribly nice souvenir of, of Gauguin, is it? The embezzler works in secret to take revenge. Take it, he does. Birito falls hard. But all is not lost, not yet. A brilliant young market in love with Birito's daughter works to help Birito recover. So that's the story. That's what he's reading. He says, I, I think I'm going to read that whole book again. Okay. So it, it is kind of like a cautionary tale, but did it really help him? When I came here, I hoped it would be possible to make some connection with art lovers here, but up to the present, I haven't made the least progress in people's affections. Can you see that he's uh, tried to make friends and he's realized that he hasn't at this point? It's like nobody likes me, nobody understands me, nobody... Um, yeah, I don't really feel affection from anyone. And Marseille, I don't know, but that may very well be nothing but an illusion. In any case, I've quite given up gambling much on it. Often whole days pass without my speaking to anyone. So yeah, here you have it. So this is actually a line that Benedict Cumberpatch read and sort of acted out in Painted with Words. And this is so um, important. 
it's a, it's a, it gives you just an idea of the scale of his loneliness. He says, whole days pass without my speaking to anyone except to ask for dinner or coffee. And it's been like that from the beginning. Bear in mind he's been in all since sort of in February. So March, April, May, June, four months of not speaking to anyone all day. And now Paul Gauguin might change that. So, you know, you might say, yeah, yeah, so he was a little bit lonely, you know, no, no, it's a very extreme level of loneliness. It's a, it's a level that few people could cope with. And he copes with it by working very, very hard. But I mean, he's a human being, he's not a robot. And he has um, weaknesses. And part of the weaknesses Cheapers, this is really getting me down today. I think I'm going to have a, a, a few drinks. So Yeri says, up to now, the loneliness has not worried me much because I've found the brightest sun and its effect on nature so absorbing. Um, well, the loneliness is going to start worrying him. Remember, I did a poll and I said, what do you think was the thing that that changed his fortunes? Was it the absent? Was it, I don't know if I said a uh, woman. Um, was it, what was it? Well, it was really the loneliness. Because if he thinks the loneliness is almost over, he's, he's only really halfway through it. And the next three months are going to be harder because it's, it's that thing where you're a little child waiting for someone who said they're coming to arrive and then they just don't. That, that loneliness is far worse. So, Deborah, I want to challenge you. Um, when last did you go through a whole day with, without talking to anyone? Like the entire day you didn't talk to anyone. And that's also a very good point that Van Gogh isn't afraid to say how he feels. Uh, some people are ashamed to say they're lonely or depressed or feeling hopeless or helpless or despondent. He is able to say that, but in a way that um, is not self-pitying and not pathetic. So Debris is two days ago so, so um, how, how did, did did can you imagine what that might be like for three or four months? Do you think you would enjoy that for three or four months? And like, I would imagine you were on chat here two days ago when when we did the last Van Gogh letter. So, I don't think that really counts. Like this, this is me talking in a way to you and I say your name and it's not quite the same, but it's a little bit like having company. Van Gogh is just literally, you know, he's, he's not, this is a thing that feels a little bit more interactive than if you were scratching a letter and then you get a letter back the next day. It, it's, I think that the worst thing is kind of the silence. Chelsea says, I'm happy when my son is with me. Carol says, I miss my family. Ison says, I went nine months on my own once, a couple decades ago. Yeah, that's also true. Also true. Stephanie says, I get depressed when I'm alone. So when I went to South Korea, um, it's quite strange. Um, it was quite terrifying to go there. In fact, I didn't actually quite know. If you said to me, show me exactly where South Korea is on a map, I, I wouldn't really have known. So I was flying somewhere to spend years of my life without actually knowing specifically where it was. I knew it was sort of near Japan. I was, I was like, I know where Japan is, it's somewhere by Japan. But I mean, that is a bit like the Hobbit 
going on an adventure where he doesn't really know what he's in for. But the point is, um, in the beginning, I found the culture shock incredibly shocking and unsettling. And then it was very quickly overtaken by this incredible thrill uh, that there was this incredible world going on that you didn't even know about. And, and I suppose because I didn't, I didn't uh, try very hard to research the place. I, I think I was scared if I did, I, I wouldn't have gone or something. And um, so, yeah, so it went, I was in, on like a high for quite a while because it was just so, everything was so different and, and um, such an adjustment. And that, that eventually faded where you realize the reality that, that you're the only, I'm exaggerating a little bit when I say this, but you're like the only white face in a sea of other people. I mean, I'm, there's some people who can go to Asia and they look like a handsome Asian with sort of curly hair, like if they're Greek or, you know, whatever. A, a ginger definitely sticks out in Asia, that, like, because they, they, they're not used to seeing green eyes um, or whatever. And um, so I don't know. So that became very lonely where you realize you don't belong actually like in the beginning they're very nice to you and it's things are done for you and so on but later on you realize i don't actually belong here um and um i think that's the most that feeling of being alienated is the most lonely aspect i think um and i think that's what he's starting to feel is that that they don't get him and they're not going to get him. And that's actually quite scary. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I was, I kind of enjoyed the first two years and then the last two years got, got hard, harder and harder. Um, and I remember one of the things that's quite hard coming from South Africa is we've got incredible weather, open spaces, clean air. And I, I started having almost like fantasies of just like getting out into the Karoo, which is like our biggest open space. And there's literally no one there. You can get out and you, you hear the, you hear your feet crunching on the, on the ground. And there's absolute silence and there's no one and there's just silence because Korea is like this place. It's just like it's the fifth most densely populated country in the world, extremely polluted as well. And, um, and so despite being lonely, I wanted to be in a very lonely place where you could at least uh, see the blue sky and hear yourself speak in a way. And, um, so I, I did get pretty lone, uh, homesick. I definitely did. And yet today I really miss Korean food. I actually went back to Korea as a journalist to cover um, uh, Seoul's, like a marketing thing for Seoul. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, let's uh, continue. Um, so he says, Write me in a day or two if you can at the end of the week uh, with a handshake ever yours, Vincent. So let's just see how long this next letter is. I think we'll do this. This will be the last letter. It's got some interesting paintings here. I don't actually think I've ever seen this one before. It's a bit of a curve in the river. Wash, woman washing as well. Can you see how he's starting to repeat the sun? The sun is starting to feature in a repeated kind of meme, right? You see that? That's That seems to me to be quite an old uh, painting. It's way past spring at this point. Maybe he's just referencing that in his letters. Look at all of those little dots. 
and there and there. But too dotty for, for my um, for my taste. It's funny at that time a chimney stack smoke coming out of a chimney was almost a novelty. You know, it was part of the industrial revolution. There's something almost pretty and different about it. Whereas for us, um, you would try to not take photos of a smokestack, you know, or want to paint it kind of thing. Okay, so let's see if I can bring up um, that form again. Dear Theo, Gauguin has arrived in good health. We have loads of work to do. He and I intend to take a tour of the brothels pretty soon, so as to study them. So uh, that's obviously jumping a little bit ahead. But you can see just from that exactly what's going to happen when Gauguin gets there. Gauguin is like, doesn't have any money, gets to, oh, well, guess what we're going to do. And so that is how quickly things are going to deteriorate when Gauguin arrives. Vincent's already going to be broken down to some extent psychologically. Well, this is going to break him down the rest of that way. He's going to try and fit in with. Um, he's going to try and fit in with Gauguin, but it's not going to work. So, if you guys want to watch this full movie, it's an hour and a half, about ninety-five minutes. I'll put a link in uh, in YouTube. Uh, I'll put the YouTube link in, into chat. Um, and then we're just going to finish off with. Uh, actually, I don't think I'm going to. It's just too late. It's 38 minutes past three in the morning here. So I'm not going to read this letter. How long is it? Yeah, I'm not going to read this letter. I'll read it in the next episode. But this is where we're heading. We, we're heading to the downward slide from this, this moment of relative triumph to this. So, yeah, um, I did, um, uh, I do have some photos here that I want to share with you. Um, this is um, part of a wheat field near Orvez. Something that Van Gogh painted. Uh, why is it not downloading? Shared in Drive. Okay. It's not, not allowing me to open it. Okay. Well. Okay, it's, it's going to take a while to show these to you, so I think, because it's downloaded via a drive. Um, let's just see if I can quickly open it. Did I? Not sure if it. Forty-three. No. I'll, I'll try and uh, try and sort this out. Sort this out on another occasion. Um. Yeah, it's, it's going to take too long. Sorry about that. Glorious says, sweet dreams, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, 
just want to have a quick look if I can just if there are any that aren't shared to drive yeah, shared to drive shared to drive uh, all of them are um, the best that I can do is um, if I show it to you I guess like this um, if I blow it up is it gonna show it to you um, Okay, so if I do it like that, then you can kind of see there's um, the Van Gogh Museum, some pictures of, um, uh, th this is in Amsterdam, it's a mill um, that is right outside the Van Gogh Museum, that's inside the Van Gogh Museum, and again, inside the Van Gogh Museum, uh, there is a uh, harvest, another harvest picture, Unfortunately, I can't just download it. It's just not allowing me to do it. Uh, there's wheat field with crows inside the Van Gogh Museum. Um, all of these are photos that I took. There's some of the books. There's something that I ate while I was there. But as you can see, these would be really nice photos to share with you. But unfortunately, um, they're not just attached. They attach via the drive. So it's a bit unfortunate. Anyway, uh, thanks, guys. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, uh, I see 50% have said himself, 29% say humanity, and I think that that is ultimately the right answer. Um, interesting news. My other channel, True Crime Rocket Science, is at 137,000 subs, so it's, um, it's still... Um, enjoying the Team Peachtree promise, if I can put it that way. So that's actually quite cool. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, uh, and, um, yeah, I, I'm hoping to have some more interesting content on this channel over the next couple of days. So don't run away. Um, yeah, uh, especially on Van Gogh letters should be really interesting. Thanks, Deborah. Um, Sarah says another night of pizzas on the books okay cool laser says humanity is hope for van gogh definitely will be here thanks guys um timmy let me just show you timmy before you you i go timmy come <laughs> hey come come boy Timmy, come. Come. Hey. Come. There he is. Come, boy, come. Yeah, so, Timmy, it's Timmy's bedtime, so I guess it's mine as well. It's been Timmy's for a while. Can you see he's had a bit of a shave? He's definitely looking... Um, smarter than usual um but that also means he's quite cold uh he needs he needs definitely needs some human warmth so definitely looks quite sleepy anyway timmy says bye bye uh we will see you guys next time um thanks a lot for joining us sorry about the weird start to, to all of this but it does happen sometimes timmy jalsi says she's so handsome Okay, take care, guys. See you guys around about this time tomorrow. Okay, take care. Ciao.